we gather in praise of a God who gives each of us the abilities which we alone possess. We do not fully understand why we were chosen to utilize these gifts, nor can we comprehend exactly how they operate. But we thank God that He enables us to accomplish those things which, by ourselves, we could never do, but which, through Him, we can bring to fruition. In gratitude to God for all things, let us, with confidence, worship God. The first reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, now, well, let me let me preface this by saying, in this particular section of what is surely his most important letter, Paul is talking about the place of Jesus in the great scheme of things, and in particular, the importance of the crucifixion. So he says, therefore... Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to the grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because of God's love that has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. While we were yet weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Why, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by His life. Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received our reconciliation. Amen. Thank you. 
Continue the reading from the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans, verses 12 through 17. Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and by that he means Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sinned, Sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. In this, Paul is weaving a very tight an unusual um, use of the Hebrew Scriptures uh, and how they relate to Jesus. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the effect of that one man's sin. For the judgment follows what that one man's sin, that one trespass, which brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's sermon is taken from Paul's fifth letter, or Paul's letter to the Romans, the, the fifth chapter, verse 8, where Paul writes, But God shows his love for us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The theme for the sermon is the Apostle Paul and Jesus. Roughly 60% of each of the four Gospels is the account of Jesus preaching and teaching and going around the region of the Galilee and giving the message of the gospel. 60%. The remaining 40% consists of events that occurred from Palm Sunday through Easter and the aftermath. 60% about three years, 40% about eight days. Surprisingly, in his own ministry, the Apostle Paul almost never said, referred to anything that Jesus said or did. In fact, he quotes Jesus only twice 
And both of those in 1 Corinthians 11 where he explains how Christians ought to celebrate the Lord's Supper. He recalls one thing that Jesus said, and this is recorded in the Gospels, where Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after that, Jesus took a cup of wine and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. And those two verses he quotes exactly as they are found in the Gospels. But that's all Paul ever said that Jesus said. And he never mentioned anything that Jesus did. Why? Why didn't Paul talk about the life of Jesus? Why did he focus only on his death and resurrection? In this series of sermons on Paul, and there will be one more next week, I've been doing some speculating about the man who next to Jesus himself was the second most important influence on the development of New Testament Christianity and ultimately what Christianity has become to this day. To be precise, there are far more words written by Paul in his letters than words that are recorded that Jesus said in the four Gospels. To put that another way, Paul said much more about what he thought Christianity was than Jesus said about what he thought Christianity was. But again, Paul said nothing about what Jesus did, and he focused solely on the crucifixion and the resurrection. What explains his silence about the rest of it? It was apparently because either Paul did not know anything at all about the life of Jesus, or else he chose to emphasize only the crucifixion and the resurrection. Most biblical scholars say that Paul's letters were all written before any of the four Gospels was written. Therefore, he had no opportunity to read what anyone said Jesus did and said in his three-year public ministry. Surely Paul had heard some of what Jesus did from, the, from Peter and the other disciples. But the most interesting event in Paul's life was this vision of the risen Christ that he had when he was going on the road to Damascus. He intended to disrupt the life of the new community of Jewish Christians that were gathered there. When Jesus himself appeared in a vision before Paul, it transformed his life in a never-to-be-forgotten conversion experience. Paul referred to this again and again throughout his letters. But it was Jesus, the crucified and resurrected Messiah, who changed Paul forever. It was not... Jesus, the preacher and teacher and miracle worker, who for three years was going around the Galilee. Paul had been a Pharisee. The Pharisees were one of the most important groups of biblical scholars then in existence among the Jewish people. For Paul to become a Christian would be as radical a transformation as when 
John Henry Newman, the Anglican priest in England, converted to Roman Catholicism and became a Catholic priest and ultimately a cardinal. This occurred in the middle of the 19th century. Or it would be as radical a conversion as when the famous Oxford professor C.S. Lewis, an avowed atheist, had a conversion experience and became one of the most influential Christians in the mid-20th century. Those who have had radical conversion experiences sometimes have a far more profound effect on Christianity than those who are raised in the faith and never have such an experience. As a Pharisee, Paul was very aware of the importance of sacrifice in Judaism. People arrange for priests to sacrifice animals on the altar at the temple in Jerusalem. They believe that that sacrifice of a living being took away their sins. When Moses was in the desert with the children of Israel, he sacrificed a lamb and then they took a goat and drove it out into the desert. The sacrifice of the lamb symbolized that their sins were taken away. The scapegoat being forced out into the wilderness was a further illustration of that symbolism. On the day of Passover, a lamb is sacrificed in each Jewish home. Again, symbolizing the taking away of sin, but also, in that case, symbolizing their escape from their slavery in Egypt when Moses led them in, out into the desert and toward the promised land. Sacrifice was a major element in Judaism. Without it, Judaism would be a far different religion. Now with all of that background as an essential part of Paul's belief system, he came to see the death of Jesus on the cross as the essential element of Christianity. Paul believed that by Jesus' self-sacrifice on the cross, he saved all Christians, present and future, from the fires of hell. A thousand years later, under a man named Anselm, that notion became solidified in Christian theology as the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. What it means is Jesus took away our sins by substituting himself as the sacrifice on the cross. However, for Jesus to be willing to sacrifice himself on our behalf, <clears throat> Paul also believed that it was necessary for us to trust that his sacrificial death is the only way we can be saved. That conviction was powerfully validated for Paul in what happened on the road to Damascus. What we now call evangelical Christianity had its origins in movements that began in Europe and in the Americas in the 16th century and continued until the present time. The Puritans who came over on the Mayflower and other ships in the 1600s, the Baptists and the Methodists of the 17th and 18th hundreds, and the Pentecostals of the 20th and 21st centuries all promoted worship 
that was intended to lead parishioners to confess their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Altar calls were, and still in many churches are, one of the visible means of promoting such conversion experiences. When I was a teenager, I was very active in the Westminster Fellowship of the Presbyterian Church, the youth program of the Presbyterian denomination. I was active in our congregation's Westminster Fellowship and in the regional presbytery and in the synod of Wisconsin. One year I attended the National Assembly of the Westminster Fellowship at Grinnell College in Iowa. I remember a kindly old minister he was probably in his late 40s or early 50s, <laughs> taking me aside to speak to me after a discussion group in which he had been the leader. Perhaps on the basis of some things that I had said in that discussion, he thought he needed to have a conversation with me. So he took me aside and asked if I had ever confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I told him that I had joined the church twice. First, in confirmation class in Kansas in the fifth grade, and then secondly, in the confirmation class in Wisconsin, which didn't occur till the ninth grade. So I joined twice. That was not what he was talking about. He told me that he wanted me to think about Jesus on the cross and to ponder hard about what that meant. He said he would wait while I took several minutes to do that. I thought as hard as I could. But at the end, I said, Nothing happened. He was sad that he, that I did not have the same kind of experience he had had as a boy of about my age. I think I understood what he wanted to transpire, but it never did. Not then, not ever. It is Jesus dying on the cross that is the transformational reality that leads many Christians to Jesus. For others, however, it is the teachings of Jesus that lead them to Him. Among the majority of mainline Protestants and most Roman Catholics, we consider ourselves Christians because we grew up in the church and we thought we were always Christians. Unless we rebelled at some point, we suppose ourselves always to have been Christians. Maybe you don't see it that way for yourself, but I see it that way for me. I guess I'm just too ordinary a person to have a bolt from the blue conversion into Christianity or anything else. I just keep plodding along and thinking about things, trying to fit it all together. Saul of Tarsus did not have that kind of personality. He was too much of a leaper. He would leap from one thing to another and then to another. But the leap of faith which changed him forever was when he saw the resurrected Christ in that vision on the road to Damascus. I have no doubt that he truly saw Jesus and that that vision propelled him to become the apostle to the Gentiles and thus the key to the phenomenal early growth of Christianity. 
But for me, and perhaps for you too, the death of Jesus on the cross was more important to Paul than it is for me, or perhaps for you. It's the life of Jesus which you might find more compelling. Jesus did not try to avoid the cross, but I certainly don't think that he had a lifetime goal of dying there. In one way or another, what evolved into Orthodox Christianity ultimately insisted that only the blood of Jesus can save us. Despite himself, Paul seems to refute that in one statement in his letter to the Romans. It's the most theological of his 13 letters. God chose his love for us. God chose his love for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The New Revised Standard Version of the Bible says that the cross illustrates God's love for us. The cross doesn't show Christ's love. It shows God's love. God couldn't die on a cross, but Jesus did die there. And Paul says that Christ's death on the cross illustrates God's love for all of us. I'm not sure he meant to say that, but that's what he said, and I enthusiastically endorse that idea. Nicholas Kristof is an opinion writer for the New York Times who occasionally reminds his writers that he is a Christian. For the Easter edition of the newspaper in 2019, he published an interview he had with Serene Jones, who is the president of Union Theological Seminary in New York. Union is one of the most liberal and progressive seminaries in the country, and has been for a long time. The Reverend Dr. Jones has been president there for several years, and she is one very liberal, progressive, feminist, womanist, black, theologian. In the interview, Dr. Jones said she couldn't understand Easter without first thinking about the cross. And about the crucifixion, she said this, the crucifixion was a first century lynching. It couldn't be more pertinent for our world today. She said, very few white theologians would ever describe the crucifixion as a first century lynching. But when a black female theologian says that, it puts the crucifixion into a whole new light. Dr. Jones went on, crucifixion is not something that God orchestrates from upstairs. The pervasive idea of an abusive God father who sent his own kid to the cross so God could forgive people is nuts. <laughs> Wowee. Those are words that most of us have a hard time wrapping our minds around. I don't recall ever hearing God called, or Jesus called, God's kid. Nor can I remember having called any theology with which I strongly disagreed nuts. I might have thought that, but I never said it, or if I did, I'm sure I would have regretted it afterward. However, here is a woman who tells it like she sees it, and Nicholas Kristof writes it like she said it. Whatever else it may do, it prompts a new way of thinking 
about an old concept that has long inserted itself into our comfortable crania. Serene Jones may have given a new insight about the cross. Perhaps it could indeed have been described as a lynching. Jesus' enemies certainly wanted him dead and as soon as possible. William Cupper was an 18th century English evangelical poet. He wrote a text for a hymn which is still a favorite in many kinds of conservative churches. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Dear dying Lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. That kind of imagery worked for several centuries, and it would have worked for Paul, but it doesn't work for me, and it may not work for you either. In a phrase, it's just too bloody awful. For Paul, the cross seemed to be everything. For other Christians, it is the primary thing. And for still others, it was a pivotal event, but not the primary thing. In this sermon, I'm only speaking for myself, and I'm not declaring that what I believe, you should believe also. But it's been my growing conviction for several decades that Paul put too much emphasis on Jesus and his crucifixion and resurrection and too little on God. He out-Jesused Jesus, as did the writer of the fourth gospel. Nonetheless, I also think that if Paul and John had not done that, historically Christianity would never have come into existence. A Jesus Christ who was magnified by the apostles Paul and John was more than the way Jesus magnified himself. Their Christ is the one that turned Christianity into the largest numerically religion the world has ever known. Without Paul and his interpretation, there'd be no Christianity. As William Cupper also wrote, God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. Whether either God or Jesus would approve of what has become traditional Christianity, we may never know. But it is what it is. And in the providence of God, it has all worked out wonderfully well. Indeed, God does move in a mysterious way His wonders to perform. Amen. May grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and dwell in your heart now and forever. Amen. Amen.